London news agents. We're going to hear from Katie. She's 28, she's an insurance broker, and she's engaged to be married to her fiancé, who's a US serviceman. After James Cleverley's announcement about immigration reforms yesterday, they won't be able to live here in the UK, her home. Yeah, so since the announcement, it's been really heartbreaking for me and my partner. So he's in the United States Air Force and we met whilst he was stationed in the UK. And our plan was always for him to move back here permanently once he separated from the military next year. But I don't earn enough for him to come back now, so that's no longer an option for us. Um, And I don't know when he's going to be able to come back here and when we're ever going to be able to live together. She earns £28,500 a year, £10,000 short of what she would need to earn to bring her fiancé to the country. And she went on to say, it seems, as a British citizen, our options are now to marry another British citizen or to be rich enough that it doesn't matter. Those are the choices that people now face as a result of this government's desire to bring down the net migration numbers as almost their top priority as they face 20 point plus deficits in the opinion polls. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And last night, the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, laid out his plans to reform immigration policy to essentially cut the number of people coming here under net migration. He wants to make it significantly harder for companies to employ foreign workers and for them to bring foreign spouses to the UK. The numbers sit upwards of 670,000 at the moment, and he wants these reforms to cut it to 300,000. So he's talking about a ban on care workers, bringing family members with them, a review on allowing foreign students to stay in the UK after their course ends, And he basically wants these measures to speak loudly and clearly of the government's top priority to control immigration, legal and illegal. The problem is the unforeseen or maybe the widely foreseen consequences of all these policy changes in terms of who comes in, who doesn't come in and what jobs are then left empty if they stay away. Well, we discussed on the podcast yesterday how we've had the King's speech, we've had the Autumn Statement, we've had the Conservative Party conference speech, and nothing has worked for Rishi Sunak in improving his poll numbers. And so they've obviously done focus group work, which says that immigration is a concern, the number one concern, and taking back control when we left the European Union um, hasn't seemed to work that well because the net migration numbers have gone soaring since we have left the EU. And so this measure came forward yesterday from James Cleverley. But what was seemed to be lacking was any accompaniment from the Treasury assessing what the impact would this have on different sectors of the economy. Yeah. And presumably you must have modelled that or you have got this out in a hurry because nothing else is working. We've got to throw something else at the wall to see if we can improve our poll rating. And migration seems to be the thing that they've alighted on, even though, as you say, Emily, the unforeseen consequence of this, will there be British citizens who want to pick up the slack and take over these care jobs if people are not going to come from abroad because they can't bring their loved ones? Question mark. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, look, this is this is a government right which is responding to events at this point now rather than in any way shaping them. They are constantly chasing their tail and chasing their politics of immigration, which they know is toxic to them. Look, they are really concerned about the prospects of seepage of their vote to reform. Uh, This, you know, sort of quasi new party being headed by Richard Tice. Um, They know that this is an area where they can try and draw some dividing lines with the Labour Party, despite the fact that the Labour Labour is actually not really saying very much about this at the moment. And they know, Sunak knows that he has a political problem on his backbenches, which is split in almost every direction on this. But there is a very clear constituency on his benches, which is furious with him. And they think that he's basically just sort of taken his eye off the ball, that he should have been able to see the fact that these migration numbers were coming, that uh, they are responding to those numbers rather than getting ahead of them. And so you have this kind of smorgasbord of options which they brought forward and which I think 
the most politically damaging or the thing that is has the most prospect of unraveling in the short to medium term is this question of dependence. Because although it is true to say most countries do have a income threshold, which means that you have to be earning a certain amount before you can bring over a potential spouse, to have, and it is also true to say that that threshold has not increased for several years, so inflation has eroded its real value. It is true to say that such a rapid jump will mean that, as we have just done, with relatively little effort, it will be possible for the media and indeed for Conservative MPs to have casework, i.e. constituents, come to them and say, but my uh, spouse was due to come, but I'm just below the threshold. Uh, I'm you know, supposed to be getting married and I can't now bring them over. And there will be case after case like that, which will suffuse all through the media. Well, on James O'Brien's show today on LBC, there were plenty of callers of that nature. Uh, this is Lee in Belfast. I woke up and I said, I feel like my life's been destroyed. Trying to find any any job, at the, even trying to find a job full off that would support on a visa is hard enough. Never mind a position that's going to pay a, a person that young that much. It's basically impossible here. The most likely outcome is I am going to have to leave the country. He's a 24-year-old recruitment researcher. He earns £26,000 a year, which was fine. He met his girlfriend in 2020. She's from Malaysia. He was planning to propose to her, get married, then live in Northern Ireland. Now they can't. So what's the equivalent? What's going to happen now? Do we lose a recruitment researcher? Do we lose a young man who was quite happily to make his life and commit to the economy of Northern Ireland in a growing industry? To Malaysia or to somewhere else. And let's not forget that this is also part of a global economy, right? There are 35 countries around the world that do not have those restrictions. So if you want to take your spouse to, I don't know, Denmark or Holland or Australia or Canada or Finland, lots of places around the EU and further abroad, you can. And I think that now becomes a consideration. And when it comes to care workers, we should we should just explain. Care workers are exempt from having to hit that higher threshold of nearly £40,000, but they will not be permitted to bring their dependents. We have 170,000 vacancies in the care work sector. So whilst James Cleverley is talking about trying to cut the number by 300,000, we are still lacking 170,000 workers in an industry which is literally looking after people's lives. And that does not solve the problem. Look, just anecdotally, you know, you talk about the global market there is for talent. Yeah. Uh, you know, my son lives in Australia, lives in Sydney. Him and his wife, they've had two small children. They're regularly using the Australian Health Service. And he tells me how often it is that they're coming across doctors, nurses who are from Britain, who've come over from Northern Ireland, who've come over from Scotland, who've come over from England, come over from Wales. And they are thinking, well, there's a better life to be had here than there is in the health service in the UK. And so they've gone. Now, those people need to be replaced. Yeah. And so we are trying to bring in talent. And if you make it more difficult to get that talent to come in, then you've got a net outflow of the people you need to run your cornerstone services of a civilised society. Yeah. I think this is all true. And I think there is a particularly, um, a particularly vexed question, as we've said, around uh, the equity of dependence, and which is a generational one as, uh, as well, because it will be young people who are unable basically to bring people that they've met in Europe or around the world or wherever in and get married and, and so on, all the things that you might just think a state should reasonably be able to provide and say is fine. And of course, there's a Brexit element to that as well, because previously young people were probably most likely to meet someone in Europe, which they could bring without any infringement or difficulty. Can't do that now. All of that said, I do think that it is legitimate for a government which is facing 700,000 net migration to try and pull some of the levers to do something about it for this reason. I am struck talking to even people in the Treasury, officials, who are normally the most sanguine about migration. They know that all other things being equal, it boosts the economy, particularly if it's well targeted. But generally speaking, given our long term demographic population problems, they favour more immigration, not less. They are concerned about the capacity of the state, 
of the resources of the state of housing, the infrastructure more widely to absorb migration at that level. So if you're not going to reduce the number of students, which you're probably not going to do because HE needs them. And, you know, there's even a question mark about whether they are migrants in the traditional term anyway. You're not going to touch care home workers as much as you are everybody where else because everyone knows that there are particular problems with that sector so where are you going to pull the levers it probably has to be on dependence it probably has to okay. be on increasing the income threshold not least because there is just a question mark about this model that we've sort of ended up in partly because of the pandemic partly yeah. because of long-term uh, problems of the state but just on that where basically more of our own workers end up on long-term sickness benefits and they are replaced by cheap foreign labour or cheaper foreign labour coming in from outside. Absolutely. That isn't a great model. It's not a great model, but it is one that the government has conceived itself. These numbers have gone up three times since before the Brexit vote. We did not used to have this aggravated a problem when there was freedom of movement. And so you, you talk about this huge number of people coming over because the government has handed out visas to these yes, people. I now, agree. if they didn't want the people to come, if we didn't need those people to come, they would wouldn't have been in a position where they were handing out the visas if they had thought perhaps a little bit more carefully about what the ramifications were of ending freedom of movement. And I understand it's not that we we don't want you know Brits to have the first chance of getting those jobs. It's not that we want all of the talent to be from overseas rather than our homegrown you know young and, and the next generation. But right now there is a gap in those jobs because Brits cannot or won't do them. And the government is talking about this wonderful freedom they've had with the levers. Their own levers have just created this problem. Well, it's not a victory. I agree. I agree with that, and it is not. I'm not defending their record. What I would say is, is that I think any government that was uh, surveying this landscape cannot be satisfied with the model we currently have. What I think, where you think, completely right is that, and this was obvious pre-Brexit, I remember doing peace on Newsnight about this, there was always so much emphasis, and this was kind of a Farage thing, and the Conservatives moved on it politically because they thought it was advantageous to them. The much revered, much hallowed, points-based immigration system, which everyone sort of talked about and moved to politically because it polled well, because basically most people assume that Australia has a particularly rigorous and tough immigration policy. And so when people say Australian style points based system, which Farage basically said once every 10 seconds for about three or four years. Yeah, because they stopped everyone coming in. They went to Nehru. Well, right. But the point is, is that it was obvious. And experts said before we move to that, be careful what you wish for, because you can have a points based system. But actually, and this is the reason that Theresa May opposed it when she was Home Secretary for many years. Actually, it is a very imprecise and actually quite unwieldy policy mechanism because yeah people get the points and then they come in as opposed to having freedom of movement where the home office doesn't have the uh, c control but individual businesses do or you have a more targeted visa regime which is potentially more bureaucratic but isn't as kind of blanket as a points-based system can be but look at the other side of this which is the wish that was expressed in the autumn statement to get more people off benefits and into work and to try to kind of stop the huge growth in the numbers of people who are permanently out of the workforce. I mean, Peter Lilly, when he was Social Security Secretary in 1992, was standing up at the Tory party conference saying, I have a little list. And it was exactly the same thing put in slightly more offensive terms about how we've got to stop the something for nothing society and we've got to draw people in and we've got to take them off benefits. Oh, it's Osborne not, said the same. It's about not the easy shirkers, to do. Exactly. The workers and the shirkers. Exactly. No, but we have seen a particularly rapid increase since the pandemic of people ending up on long term sickness benefit related benefits and there is a lot of concern within government on that rightly i think no of and course. from the treasury you know we're looking at potentially up to three million by the end of the decade that is a problem and it's not good for those people and it's not good for I think, the I think overall the macro economy surely you need some management on... surely agree... you need some management that you've got the people available before you block off yeah. the turn off the time and you've got to and as country. labor said you know i you've think got we're to also kidding ourselves if we think that the people who at the moment are sitting at home and not able to work are going to walk into care homes and look no, after the not. elderly, look after the disabled, look after our children. I understand that we're talking about sort of filling gaps, but I think when you hear the government say we want, you know, we want homegrown labour to do this and we want training schemes to do this, they're not going to do that in the next 18 months. No, you know? that, that and is, this is a crisis that's getting picking. worse. Right. There, there's plenty of jobs for fruit pickers if people want to do fruit picking. People don't want to do fruit yes, picking. Yes, it is true. Although some of these people coming in 
are taking jobs, which are not those sort of jobs. I mean, don't taking the jobs. They are taking the jobs of people who have left the workforce voluntarily or not voluntarily. So it isn't just care home workers. But there is a long term discussion, which we've had before and which we need to have much more, which is the fact is that a longer term, our demography is such and our economy is such that high levels of migration probably are inevitable. The thing is, and you're not hearing it from Labour either, no one, literally no one at a parliamentary level in British politics, really, is willing to make that argument. OK, we're going to hear now from Imogen and the situation these new rules have put her in. I met my husband while I was working abroad as a teacher. If we decide to live in the UK in the future, it will now be much more difficult to do so because my salary may not be high enough to meet the threshold. This would mean either not being able to come home or being separated. This new financial threshold will penalise many families, potentially leading to breakups and children growing up without their parents together. It is punitive and it will not have any impact on illegal migration. And what we should say, of course, is that these new rules won't come in till April. So I guess you can expect a flurry of people oh, yeah. who are marrying, coming in more quickly, trying to get their act together or making incredibly rash, big decisions within the next four months to try and get ahead of the immigration policy And, and that goes back to some of the unease that I was talking about at the very start in terms of Conservative opinion or backbench opinion on Downing Street just losing control of the politics of it. Because let's assume... <laughs> There's an election in late in the autumn, or even or even, even in May. In May. Oh, and yeah. you know these figures. Well, I suppose if it were in May, then we wouldn't have the next figures. But let's assume they're in the autumn, and the figures come out in June. Well, it's, what's it going to show? It's going to presumably show yeah. quite a big spike. Guess what? In February, March, April time, the thing and I, the next lot of figures could be even worse. Yeah, the thing I can't get over is going back to the Rishi Sunak conference placard which was about long term decisions for a brighter future and don't think it may have been maybe we deal. are wrong but it takes you back to the podium the Rishi Sunak podium a long term decision for a brighter future nothing we're hearing at the moment nothing we're hearing at the moment talks of a government who's actually thinking about the long term economy the long term consequences the long term movement of its own people and of and foreign workers you're not getting that sense at all you're getting a man who suddenly worked out he's less popular than <laughs> Liz Truss in the polls and is going what now what now and fair enough he's got two wings of his party who are both now fighting each other to get a piece of him the new Conservatives, who think he should go much further, Suella Bravman received yesterday's announcement with the words, this has all come too late and we have to go much further. And you hear from the One Nation Tories who think this is going to be catastrophic for all the reasons you've outlined. You've even got, even within the government, you have got Robert Jenrick, who is the Immigration Minister, saying he wants to hit the target of the manifesto in 2019 net Good migration luck. of 250,000 whereas Rishi Sunak is saying that he would be happy to get back to the numbers when he took over yeah. 500,000 I wonder so what he's he, thinking about so <laughs> even within the government you've got people sending out different signals about what they think is an acceptable number for net migration it is extraordinary it is the politics of panic they're all over the place we should also look at illegal immigration as well because James Cleverly has just landed in Rwanda. And he thought his air miles would stop now that he was Home Secretary. <laughs> They've only just begun. But he was the one, reportedly, who thought the whole Rwanda policy was batch crazy, who is now trying to sign into law a treaty with Rwanda which somehow gets round the findings of the Supreme Court just two weeks ago, which decried the policy as unlawful. That's all to come after the break. So James Cleverly, as we speak, is in Kigali, in Rwanda, uh, presumably about to sign this new treaty that he has drawn up with the Rwandan government, where they're going to promise to meet some of the concerns of the British Supreme Court, which said, try again, this nowhere near passes muster. When they looked at the proposal for those seeking asylum to be moved to Rwanda, where they're application would be processed and there were so many questions that the Supreme Court had about it that they said you've got to go back to the drawing board and the government has gone back to the drawing board and we're waiting to see what the detail of that looks like. And this is part of this sort of twin twin approach that the government has decided to, to try and take which is one step short of doing what 
some many on the conservative right want them to do which is just say right we're going to pull out the ECHR the European Convention on Human Rights the government think that they can basically try and finesse this policy to be one step short of that where they get a new agreement with Kigali which puts into international law some of the undertakings that were as part of the uh, agreement that they'd had with Rwanda before hoping that that will appease the Supreme Court and also and that's sort of fair enough but then also do this thing, which I'm, I'm, I find far more curious. And I was very, I was very struck by the way that uh, Generate was talking about it on the radio this morning. Pass this emergency set of legislation, or this emergency piece of legislation, uh, where Parliament decides to basically negate some of the concerns that the Supreme Court had. So, for example, Parliament will say that it is content that Rwanda is a safe place to send people. Now, this, this I find extraordinary, and it is what. Lord Sumption, the former Supreme Court judge, has also talked about in the past couple of weeks, which is this idea that Parliament can just kind of decree, can just say that something is safe when it's not, can say that black is white. I mean, it's all very well for Parliament to, to say what it likes. But if the court judges through the evidence that it had previously seen that it thinks that Rwanda is not safe and it is not content with the undertakings even as part of international law, then they're unlikely to change their opinion. Yeah, I think that's why we didn't hear anything that looked like a detail from Jenrick today because they are once again stuck in the middle of this thing where their right flank is saying, pull out the ECHR. You've got civil servants who are going over my dead body, I'm not going to sign off something that breaks international law. You've got another flank of the party saying, I really don't think that's the way to go. I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole full fat, skimmed, all the rest of it, milk analogies, but essentially they cannot actually tell us what they're going to do because the thing that cleverly, I assume, would like to do best is just sort of sign something, <laughs> you know, that looks like a treaty that nobody's going to look at too like closely. To well, probably. I mean, he, he signed a letter today when he visited the Holocaust Museum of Rwanda, where he actually dated his own signature November the 6th instead of December the 6th, maybe sort of harking back to a happier time before he actually had to confront this problem. But I think every time Jenrick was pushed this morning to lay out what his idea was or what the plan was, he can't say. It's not that they don't know what they want to do. It's that every bit of the party is pulling them in a slightly different direction. Oh, there Spider's is leg stuff. Exactly. And there is one other group that you didn't mention, yeah. the Whips Office. The Whips Office who are going to be the people who are going to have to navigate this in emergency legislation through the Commons and more particularly through the Lords, the Lords where this yeah. could be taken apart. And so you've got a Whips Office who, and we're going to come to this in a minute, who didn't have a great night last night, who are going to have to advise the government... If you go this way, you're going to lose this lot. Yeah. And if you go that You've way... You've got 35 you're going to... of, the, of the new Conservatives <coughs> who say we want, you know, pulling out the ECHR or nothing, make sure it's hardline. And Robert Jenrick is now... Blink and you miss it. Suella may have gone, but, but Jenrick is her embodiment on earth right now. No one saw that one coming. This is really crucial about uh, the sort of parliamentary process which comes next. They're going to try and rush this through. It's going to be amended to death in both the Commons and the Lords. It's going to be a nightmare. Everyone always constantly talks about this massive majority that the government has got. I mean, it was never that big, 80 in the first place. But now, as a result of various by-elections and people losing the whip, endless numbers losing the whip, they only need to lose 29 Conservative MPs. The majority is gone, which we saw last night. We can talk about in a minute. That's going to be a problem. And what I'm most struck by is the way that Rwanda, and I think this is this is how, this is basically, I think, what Cleverly was saying in that Times or alluding to in that Times interview when he basically said it's not such a big deal or it shouldn't be such a big deal. It's just one component of the regime that we're trying to put into place. This The Rwanda thing, which basically everyone knows in Whitehall, most thinking people within the Conservative Party, within Parliament, more widely know that it's not workable. And if it is, it by some miracle, ends up being workable, is only going to be able to absorb a relatively small number of people. And so it just kind of isn't really worth the political cost. And yet... It has become this kind of like litmus test for the Conservative Party and for any aspirant Conservative leader or senior Conservative politician to deviate from it. It's become a little bit like Brexit or freedom of movement. It has become a, a litmus test of one's conservatism. Do you support the Rwanda plan patriotism. or not? And even patriotism, yeah. And if you have someone like Cleverly who basically comes along and goes, well, it is maybe not the most sort of 
well thought through or cohesive policy idea in the world. And anyway, it's not going to really do that much anyway. Suddenly he loses tremendous standing. We saw what happened yesterday in the conservative well, rankings, this conservative uh, home. They do a poll of conservative activists every month or so. And it shows which cabinet minister is most popular in order from top to, to bottom. Did you cleverly, listen to yesterday's episode? Of course I did. I'm just saying, <laughs> cleverly is the same. Decided, declined, you know, what, like 10 places? So this is kind I, of crazy. You've re- referred a couple of times to the loss yesterday and I think we should just lay out what we're talking about to our listeners who missed this because it was Rishi Sunak's first Commons defeat um, last night when MPs, including 23 of his own, voted to accept an amendment tabled by a Labour MP, Diana Johnson, which was to speed up compensation for victims of the infected blood scandal. This is an absolutely terrible scandal. It's the worst health scandal that we've ever seen. In the history of the NHS. In the history of the NHS, which involved many, many people, more than I think a thousand people, over the 80s and 90s getting infected with blood, leading to hepatitis, leading to HIV. And this was Diana Johnson's attempt to bring forward their compensation payout before the inquiry had finished. And I think what we realise from this, which is a huge victory, and we should first of all say it's a massive victory for the victims who, who get their well-deserved payout now, but it is also a massive miscalculation on the part of Rishi Sunak, who was resisting it, who will come across, who will be known as the last Conservative MP to try and deny this payout to victims ahead of the inquiry. And as I say, the fact that there were enough MPs of his own side to vote against the government with the Labour backbencher, with the Labour shadow cabinet, to force this one into a Commons defeat for him makes him look like he just didn't get it. It's going to be a massive payout, make no mistake. It's going to be, we think, up to £20 Uh, billion. So clearly, from a Treasury perspective, from a money perspective, it's something that he can't afford. Nobody can afford it politically but, but it, it had to be done it's worth just underlining how awful it was that these people contract hepatitis as a result of being contaminated you know, which was contaminated yeah. and i think that the government was hoping to wait until the report eventually comes out mm. before making a decision on it and people thought well, we could be in an election then it will mean that people who've had th- their lives upended are going to be jerked around even yeah. longer yeah. and so the commons just took the view we've got to do this last night and defied the government, and it brought a really spectacular defeat. I mean, I think it sounds like there was a change of heart. Diana Johnson petitioning Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, late last week to say, you've got to get behind this. And Rachel Reeves then telling Jeremy Hunt that, that Labour was behind it, and they were going to vote in this way. So the only surprise was to Rishi Sunak that his own backbenchers were going to support them. But the point is, I mean, it's important this issue in its own right, but the point is, is that for the whips to miscalculate that badly, for the chief whip to miscalculate that badly, for the prime minister to miscalculate that badly, you should not be losing votes in the House of Commons about an issue like this. shouldn't be losing votes full stop. But to lose a vote on this indicates that, once again, and it is the latest iteration of this, that, again, the sort of political antenna of Number 10 and the whip's office is kind of off. And that does not bode well, as we've said, for what will be basically the last big serious piece of legislation to go through this parliament before the election and one around which their politics will be dripping from every word and from every page and it does not bode well for Sunak. And when you've got so many MPs that are standing down at the next election there's a limited armoury of threats that can come from the whip's office to say to you you've got to stay in line and the history of rebellions is that once you've got a taste for it people go back again. And they're more willing to rebel in the future because they've seen that they have rebelled. Nothing has happened to them. The earth has not stopped spinning. The sun is still rising in the east and setting in the west. And they think, you know what, I'm going to rebel again. Discipline. And that's the danger. I, I am struck consistently by the extent to which discipline in this in, in this parliament and in the Conservative Party right now appears to be fraying kind of almost week by week. It's not the first time that this has been true. It happened under Johnson uh, and Truss as well. But uh, the extent to which this is a government which was delivered you know, a pretty strong majority and almost from the beginning and particularly of late, it does not feel like it. And that is partly because of the factionalism within the Conservative Party now, it's not just left and right, it's kind of bisected in every which way you can think of. 
it, the Conservative Party is so riven by factionalism that it just does not feel like a cohesive parliamentary party. Yeah, I also think the Tory divisions are making life easier for Labour right now than they really should. Yeah. I mean, if you take it back to your comments at the beginning about Labour's position on immigration and the reforms, we still don't know. Labour has not been questioned quite as stringently as it should be on what they would accept and what they would change. They will tell you that they gave cleverly the first idea to remove the, the discount on foreign workers' salaries. They got that in the bag. But we don't know whether they'd agree with, you know, the refusal to bring dependents. We don't know whether they'd have a longer list of excluded jobs, workers. We just don't know because there is so much heat and so much airtime being consumed by all the various flanks of the Conservatives that Labour's actually strolling through this one when they shouldn't be, quite frankly, because if Labour get in, it's going to be their problem. I think the phrase is keeping the head down, yeah. laying low. Yeah. Well, we'll be back in a moment when Boris Johnson will be appearing before the COVID inquiry. Another great day for the Conservatives ahead. So how many bowls of popcorn are we bringing in tomorrow? For... Actually, relatively few. Oh, really? Because I feel that... <laughs> wine gums? Well, you know I never say no to a wine gum. I, I do know. I never say no to a wine gum. But I think if we're expecting tomorrow to be kind of showtime at the COVID inquiry... Boris Johnson has done an absolutely brilliant, impeccable job at trying to take all the heat out of it. He's literally given his words to journalists ahead of his appearance and he's tried to write the narrative of how we will report it. And what he's done, very typically Boris Johnson is to say, unquestionably there were mistakes, but I got all the big calls right. And he'll sound as if he's a man who is contrite and feels badly about those who lost their lives, but will actually end up turning it around and saying, I think you'll find that actually everyone was on board and, you know, disagreements were quite useful and I got the big calls right. I think that's right. And I think the pre-spin has been good, but I think there are two caveats to it. One is that what he cannot control is the uh, material that the inquiry releases ahead of time, i.e. Yeah. all the WhatsApp messages that they've been reviewing. And we've seen already this be quite embarrassing for several of the people who've taken to the stand already. So there's going to be more information. Information, by the way, which normally, typically, with the government departmental records and release of information, we wouldn't get for years and years and years to come. And the other thing is, although Johnson, I'm sure, you know, is nothing if not a performer, will be doing exactly as you say, Emily, and try and do I'm as contrite as possible. And you know, and He's funny enough, he's very good at apologising for things that well, he, he doesn't really take responsibility for. Yeah, yeah. But... It is still not his natural way of being. Right? Well, it didn't it's go very well natural... before the Parliamentary Select Committee. No, it's not famously. his natural arena, right? Johnson thrives most over doing exactly what we've all seen him do. When he's with journalists, when he's with a crowd, when he can give the little bit of a, of a joke and an aside and a wink and a kind of slightly flirtatious kind of sort of political personality. He can't do that this time. He can't do it with a, with a KC who is going to be absolutely uncharmable, who is going to be unmalleable, who is just going to absolutely try and nail him to the mast as much as possible on specific points of information and inquiry and that is not his natural arena by any stretch of the imagination. I want to say a word about political journalism because I mean the three of us are political journalists and there are times when we have on the podcast talked about you know sources close to or we've been told by a senior backbencher or a government minister that this has happened and that has happened. If you read the Times newspaper on Friday it was endless, endless article about Boris Johnson is expected to say. He's expected to argue. He's expected to counter criticism that. He's expected to do this. He's expected to say that. The word expected appeared about 70 times in this article. And it was not because they've got some kind of magical insight into it. They've obviously seen the document that Boris is going to use as the basis for his argument. How could they have seen that? Yes, and they can't say that. And you know damn well that Boris Johnson has given them that in return, probably for saying, you make this the front page splash. And well, you it's give not it just down to journalists. I mean, a journalist's uh, responsibility, I guess, is to get the stories. Of course. The editor's responsibility is to decide whether you cast a sceptical eye on what is being told to you, right? And where you put it. But you don't, get, you but you don't get it if you give the scepticism. Right. That's the danger. And right. so you end up with, it was a pre-press release from Boris Johnson that took up a huge amount of space in a newspaper. Which I should imagine Lady Hallett, the chair of the inquiry, would have been pretty furious about. And is, again, just vindication of what Boris Johnson has always been, right? Boris Johnson has always been the fusion 
between and the perfect embodiment of uh, the Westminster SW1 kind of a lobby political system plus politics and Westminster. But and also he is the man, that embodied in a way that Trump is American television yeah, entertainment fusion but, with but also the man, fusion with politics. The man who fundamentally doesn't believe that institutions apply to him, that can set up the COVID inquiry, but then go round the back door, that can say I'm going to appear before them, but make sure that his story is told and understood and has been curated before he ever gets there. It's the same Boris Johnson that doesn't really believe in parliamentary democracy, who doesn't really believe in the standards committee, doesn't really believe in the select committees because he thinks somehow it doesn't apply to him. You see, you started arguing that we won't need much popcorn tomorrow. I still think we're going to need quite a lot. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 